The seal with which the elegant letter was adorned was an object of fear for an entire country, but would represent hope to 10 people around the world. This seal was made up of four overlapping circles, the top one being the largest, the sides medium-sized, and the bottom circle the smallest. Should this not be a monochrome seal, each circle would be a unique color that distinguishes it from the rest whilst also complementing them. But this seal was monochrome. And that was the first thing that the tired lab worker noticed when he was sent to grab the mail. He yawned. Really, for as fancy as this looks, this letter should really... He yawned again before continuing in a disappointed voice. Really, have more colors. Less is just boring. The man monologued to himself about each of the letters that he saw that had arrived in the mail in that early morning. The sun had just broken over the horizon, shining right over the mountains through many trees of the forest and right into the man's eyes. <laughs> the man threw up his hands to cover his unevenly shaven face from the light. The letters flew out of the man's hands and all over the ground. He chuckled at his own clumsiness before picking a letter out of his untamed, dirty blonde hair. He began picking the letters up off the ground, and then headed inside the laboratory. As he walked through the entranceway that resembled an airlock, he looked up at the lab symbol on the wall. It was a small P with what looked like an I within it. A darker X peeked out from behind the P, a significant letter for such a position, considering it stood for the first name of the laboratory's founder. The lab was named after its founder, Xavier Payton, and it was just as eccentric as the name. Walking along the white and gray halls lined with fluorescent lights, the man focused only on the apparently interesting letter, not even bothering to clean the dirt off his white lab coat that was accumulated from picking the letters up off the forest floor. Upon turning a corner, he entered through an automatic door that opened from the middle and went out to the sides. A blast of noise and conversation greeted the man. One man with a multicolored lab coat and large round glasses immediately came up to him and inquired about what interested him. Another lab worker approached him and continued his earlier teasing about the unkempt man's unlucky streak, causing him to draw a short straw and go get the mail. Yet another worker, this one neat and well-kempt, walked up to him and reached out his hand expectantly. After shuffling through the many letters, the unkempt man gave the other worker their letter. Distributing the letters was no small feat, because although there were only a little over a dozen lab workers, they were scattered all over the laboratory, working with all sorts of gizmos and experiments. The unkempt man was luckily very agile, and was able to dodge spinning, whirring, and lethal-looking machines. He now only had a single letter to deliver, and for this one, he knew exactly where to go. His excited footsteps echoed throughout the long halls as his walk sped up. As he walked down the halls, his thoughts became more excited as well. He was the only worker whose contact with that room that was his destination was rare. The lab worker's unlucky streak had hardly begun that morning with drawing the short straw. He routinely was assigned chore duty to the point where he wondered whether his job was to be a scientist or just a Roomba with health insurance perks. He was never assigned to visit this room, even though it was the most interesting in the lab. The only times he had ever been here had been for cleaning. Perhaps it was actually a stroke of luck that he was placed here after all. He was never really an optimist, but he could be one if he wanted to. The unkempt man felt uncharacteristically excited as his steps morphed cleanly into a trot. He rounded the corner and continued down the long hallway, passing by multiple corridors and doors until he reached the end of the hallway and turned into a room with a plaque labeled Room 103. The door opened and the scene before the unkempt man surprised him. Normally, one person was supposed to be in this room with the test subject, but there were three people, including the subject. The multicolored lab worker that had questioned him earlier was standing next to the desk on the far wall, at which the subject sat. The woman that had been assigned to work with the subject that day was also there, and they were conversing with the test subject. The room also surprised him, as it had been a while since he had been in there. The walls were a light seafoam green, and the room itself looked like the room of a rather bookish young adult. There was a neatly made bed in the corner with monochrome sheets, bookshelves along the wall that had been ransacked, and a window on the opposite wall that allowed the morning sunlight to pass through, and a desk at which a seemingly normal high school student sat. The books that had been taken from the bookshelves lay scattered on the floor and desk, under yet another symbol of the lab. The two other lab workers looked up at the disheveled worker's entrance, looking unsurprised at his arrival. See, I told you. I believed you, replied the other worker crossly. 
Oh, Samu, did you... She asked. Yes, I knew he was coming. You should have believed him. The subject spoke in a low, bored voice. Dang it. She furiously whispered to herself. Hey, I have a letter for you, Osamu. Uh, the worker said. He wasn't sure how to speak with the subject. He wasn't even sure if he had ever spoken with him before. The subject was a lean boy with messy white hair, one long strand of which curled up and twisted so that it faced up. He was wearing a lab coat marked with the emblem of the lab, and his shirt underneath was the color of poison. I'm not sure why they didn't give him warmer, more inviting colors. A letter? From whom? The female worker asked, frantically. Bring it over here, and be smarter about this. You're giving an AI system a letter, not encountering a spider or whatever other fears you humans have. Although you're not boring, so maybe... He gave the worker a long, searching look, then sighed. Just give it to me. Okay, here you are, said the worker as he handed over the letter. The boy fumbled with the letter before handing it off to the woman next to him. Stupid human hands, he whispered to himself. As I was saying, where is my main caretaker, Satoshi Kubota? He's sure to have been here four minutes ago. The female worker had walked to the other side of the room to use the letter opener on that side. She turned back to face Osamu before responding. He must be late again. She replied. What is keeping him? That is the second time this year. Did he hit another deer because he was too absorbed in his work again? Osamu asked bluntly. Remember, Osamu, he asked you not to repeat that story. She said patiently. I'm sure he just forgot to set his alarm this morning. Although the letter had been opened, it remained in her hands. Come on, just give him the letter. Do you even recognize the seal on this? It's from another country. Who in any country could possibly know about him? It's too suspicious. We should wait for Kubota-san before we decide what to do with this. The female worker shot back. It's a letter. It'll be fine. Just give it to him. He's not a child. Technically, he is! He's basically- The female lab worker's face turned red before she could finish her sentence. The conversation ended there with the multicolored lab worker holding out his hand expectantly for the letter. She held onto the letter hesitantly for a moment before the multicolored lab worker snatched it out of her hands and gave it to Osamu. The female worker looked shocked, but like the rest of the room, she waited to hear what it said with bated breath. It wasn't every day that a letter addressed to a secret project no one knew about came from a foreign country. Very well. Osamu cleared his throat before reading the letter out loud. Dear Mr. Kubota, we are pleased to inform you that- I'm here! Sorry I'm late, I hit another deer because I was too absorbed in my- Why are there so many people in here? I thought it was just me in here today. Began the white-haired scientist that had just entered the room by ricocheting off of the doorframe. His hair was nicely combed, save for the back where it stood up crazily. His white beard and rosy cheeks gave him the impression of a slimmer Santa Claus, although he wore none of the traditional Saint Nick clothes. He wore another lab coat, although he had his name embroidered in red and he wore a high security clearance badge around his neck. The unkempt worker knew who this was, the man in charge of the experiment, Satoshi Kubota. You must have read the schedule wrong again, Kubota-san. <laughs> I'm with Osamu today, although you will want to be here for this, stated the female lab worker. Osamu? Got a letter with the seal of a foreign government on it. How? What? Open it, Osamu. What does it say? Shouted Satoshi. First, I should say, it is nice to see you this morning, Kubota. Then, without pausing, he moved right on into the letter. Dear Mr. Kubota, we are pleased to inform you that you have been selected to compete in a prestigious scholarship competition put on by the government of. This competition will be held in one week, on December 10th, at an undisclosed location. You will be picked up at the intersection marked on the map below by our employees. Guests are not allowed. The winner will receive funding for all of their future education for the rest of their lives, and will also receive $1,500 per year in grants for research opportunities throughout their lives. Each participant is selected based on their talent, exceeding in their field of study like no other. Only when they are the best in their respective countries with leading research, skill, and breakthroughs in their field will they be given a new title for their abilities. 
referred to as Ultimate Talent. You have been invited to this competition as the ultimate artificial intelligence. Your skills of growing in knowledge and publishing that knowledge in the form of research papers on par with that of the most intelligent professors, among other things, has led us to scout you as an ultimate. We hope, for your sake, that you will accept this invitation and meet us on December 10th at 8 p.m. at the marked location. Sincerely, M.K. Osamu finished reading the letter with the same tone with which he started it. A long silence came afterwards, broken only by a squeal from Satoshi. Oh my gosh, Osamu! cried Satoshi, his eyes sparkling with excitement. You could go to another country and get a ton of money and help someone to be Breathe, Kubota-san, said the female worker patiently. While Satoshi gasped for air, Ojamu interjected with his inquiry. I suppose you think I should go. This statement seemed to calm Satoshi down and made him think for a moment. Of course I want you to go, but it's your own choice, he replied. The people there won't be boring, and you could do a lot of good if you won. Give me ten hours to consider the benefits and drawbacks of this opportunity, commanded Osamu. Okay, but remember your objective when considering your choice. I don't want you to forget it, Satoshi said with concern in his voice. Of course I remember my objective. Bring as much good to as many people as possible, replied Osamu with the same bored voice. Now leave. I'm going to obtain more knowledge now with these seven books. Turning away from the other people in the room, Osamu continued. Be sure to send Maki in here at 12. She and I must continue our game of chess. And Makoto and I will be doing more research on microorganisms at 2. Send her as well. I am feeling as though some sort of burning sensation is in my chest. Inform me of this feeling. That's excitement. It's a feeling that humans get when they look forward to something that makes them happy. Satoshi smiled as he explained. Excitement. Perhaps not all aspects of humanity are boring. These feelings are... Leave me. I will need to research this, commanded Osamu. After obliging patiently, Satoshi led the others out of the room. The unkempt man pulled Satoshi aside as the female worker left and asked, So he finds humans boring, right? Why are you making him play chess and do research with humans? What purpose does that serve? Inquired the disheveled man. Oh, we didn't make him do that. He wanted to do those things. Your information is outdated, isn't it? Replied Satoshi. We are the only people that he doesn't find boring. He finds the people at this lab interesting. Er, not boring at least. But he does find every other part of humanity boring. So, have we failed? I don't think so. I have hope. Kubota-san, are you sure this isn't another of your, well, false hopes? Hmm. Yes, I know this for a fact. He is going to make the world a better place. Just you wait. Okay. I have some work to do, so I'm gonna head back to my office. Unless you need anything from me. As a matter of fact, could you deliver all nine of these coffee packets to the other workers? Their names are written on the front. Sure. The unkempt lab worker's luck was not getting any better. Ten hours later, on the dot, Satoshi knocked on the door to Osamu's room. With no response, he opened the door and came through to see if Osamu was still in there. He was sitting once again at the desk. He turned to Satoshi and agreed to go to the competition without any hesitation. Satoshi smiled, then threw his arms around Osamu, squeezing him tightly. Their faces were total opposites. Satoshi was beaming with pride and joy while Osamu looked bored and vaguely uncomfortable in his arms. After a few more seconds of the tight hug, Satoshi released Osamu and immediately began planning everything, including his outfit, transportation, food, directions, everything. Satoshi was so excited for Osamu, and he had to be reminded yet again to pause in his many plans to breathe. And we'll have to get airplane tickets for all of us because we'll want to come see you off, but it's in a week, so we'll have to... Satoshi paused in his seemingly endless plans. His face slowly morphed into a grin. Was that a smile, Osamu? Absolutely not. Your deteriorating human brain must have imagined it. Osamu replied in the same low, mon monotone voice as usual. He wasn't quite sure why he lied. He would have to research this, too. 
One week later, a disappointed Satoshi walked alone with Osamu into the airport. Due to an unknown reason, Osamu was the only one left with a valid boarding pass. It was like the rest of their passes had vanished from the internet itself. Satoshi worried over the bored Osamu, who was dressed up in his usual outfit. You have your boarding pass, right? And you have your invitation? And your toothbrush? And... Osamu let Satoshi continue his questions. It would make more logical sense for him to wait until the end to say yes. They continued to walk together until they reached the busy checkpoint security area, where the noise from all the hustle and bustle made it difficult to talk. But they did not need to talk. Satoshi leaned in for one last embrace before Osamu was whisked away into the crowd of people, clamoring to get onto whatever flight they needed to. Osamu The land outside the airport was a stark contrast to what it was inside. The dark and grimy city loomed all around me as a light rain floated down through the many layers of the city. I had gotten out on the lowest level of the airport, so dark buildings and busy roads rumbled above me. It was later in the evening, around 7.30, so the street lamps had begun to turn on, although some light was still left in the day. The roads that stretched into the sky along with the buildings gave an impression of being underground in a hole looking up. The traffic buzzed and rumbled up above me, leaving almost no traffic down on the ground level, save only for the occasional car that drove down the grimy, dark road. As I walked along towards my destination, I noted that having tinted windows was a definite trend among those that lived here and owned cars. The water made my hair wet, but I had predicted this and organized my hair to minimize the extent to which it would impair my vision. I had already checked the map, so I had no reason to use it again, so I threw it away where it safely and softly landed underneath the building. The walk was uneventful, save for some sort of cat that I had never seen before. I made a mental note to add it to my database as I moved on. Upon reaching the destination, I waited for the exact amount of time that was needed before 8 o'clock. Just as I was thinking about how bad the government's timing was, a small black limo pulled up onto the street and drove towards the intersection I stood at. It pulled up silently, and the back door opened, revealing a plain interior. I got in and sat on a leather seat opposite the door. The car smoothly pulled away from the stop. The window that usually allowed guests to speak to the driver was closed, so the driver was blocked from my view. I did not ask any questions, as I would be able to find out all that I needed to know once we got there. It would be a waste of breath anyway. We drove for about 15 minutes, transitioning up in the levels so that we were eventually on the highest road in sight, traveling alongside the top floors of the tall buildings, which became cleaner and shinier as we increased in height. Then, without warning, I heard a... It was coming from somewhere within the limo. The sound grew louder, and as I whipped my head away from the window, I immediately noticed what it was. White smoke was pouring out of the openings that would normally procure warm or cold air to fit the passenger's comfort level. Not knowing what the smoke was, as it was not like anything I'd ever seen, except perhaps steam, I leaned forward to smell what it was. That was a mistake I would not make again. I quickly realized that my human body was shutting down. I tried to knock on the driver's window to let them know that something was wrong with their vehicle, but my arm went limp before I could do anything like that. My vision went black and my human body fell exactly in the trajectory that I had planned onto the long seat. <laughs>